Of course, I want to thank Frederic for inviting me. I want to congratulate Barnabé on a fantastic piece of work. And I think his dissertation isn't the sort of thing you see all the time. I mean, it's very, very impressive. Um, so I came to talk about things around Darbu, and it's, as Frédéric said, a German perspective on things. I could have labeled this an American in Paris, I guess. Uh, this building, you know, was funded with Rockefeller money, and George Burkhoff came to Paris and met with Borel and so forth, and, uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation then uh, decided that they would fund the Institut Henri Poincaré and the Institut in Göttingen. And since Göttingen is part of my talk, I thought I should start with something like this. And this is, of course, Birkhoff's picture of a, the centers of mathematics in Western Europe and so forth, divided into disciplines and so forth. And so uh, I guess, Elaine, I can confirm that analysis is very important in Paris. Uh, that's the dominant field there. It's kind of a funny map where you can find funny things and it's not to be taken too seriously. So um, this is the other building that was built in 1929. And the designer was Otto Neugebauer, uh, well known as a historian of mathematics, of course. And models were important there, too. So this is what it looks like today if you go upstairs and then you can see things that remind you of this building. Uh, OK. I, uh, for a solemn occasion like this, I decided I should bring a text. And I will then try to read it in such a fashion that you won't be bored entirely. Uh, I don't normally do this, but I, th I think this is a special occasion. So in this talk, I'll try to give a picture of how Gaston Dabou, Dabou was viewed by some of his contemporaries, particularly the German community. As the leading French geometer of his generation, Dabou was admired by many distinguished foreign mathematicians who knew his work well. Sophus Lee, Julius Weingarten, Luigi Bianchi, and of course, Felix Klein. Dabou met Klein and Lee already in 1870, and he corresponded with both of them very regularly afterward. He also wrote a very warm obituary for Sophus Lee, who died in 1899. And so it might seem, given these personal connections, somewhat odd that when Dabou died in 1917, it was not Klein who wrote his obituary, but it was Hilbert. And that's a, a story I will come to. Uh, Gilbert wrote his obituary and delivered it as a speech in Göttingen. Uh, perhaps, well, that's, that's what I want to come to. Um, so many French mathematicians were aware of this. Uh, maybe because it was reproduced in, in Hilbert's collected works in 1935, but more likely because Mittag Leffler produced a French translation of it in 1919 and published it in Acta Mathematica at that time. Um, Laurent Schwartz commented that such a public pronouncement as Hilbert's in wartime would have been unthinkable in France. And perhaps he was right, but I think he went too far when he wrote that chauvinism during the First World War was greater in France than in Germany. I'll return to Hilbert's eloge later, but first let me say a few words about relations between French and German mathematicians in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War. Given the fact that Amy Picard's father died during the siege of Paris and that Paul Appel's family fled from Strasbourg to Nancy, one can easily imagine the impact that that war had on their views of the new German state. Henri Poincaré and his, and his family worried about a similar fate that might fall, befall Nancy, 
when it was under occupation. A German military official was then stationed at their home, and it was at that time that the 16-year-old Henri learned to speak German. He was always thinking about things, creative things. In his uh, Denier Pensee, he wrote, well, he, this is the translation of what he wrote, obviously. <laughs> uh, when asked to justify rationally our love of country, we can be quite embarrassed, but our mind imagines our defeated armies. France invaded. We feel altogether nauseous. Tears begin to flow, and we listen no further. And if there are those today who repeat so many sophisms, it's most likely due to their lack of imagination. They are unable to imagine by themselves all this suffering. And if misfortune or some divine punishment fix their eyes upon it, their soul would revolt as do does our own. Dabu was slightly older. I don't know exactly how he felt about these things, but probably not so differently. Um, of course, we've heard from Elaine already about his very open style in terms of foreign contributions, etc., and so forth, but we can come to that. Um, obviously, the Franco-Prussian War did have a big impact on German and French relations in mathematics, but nowhere near as great as, as the real Great War. And in fact, Klein already wrote to Darbu in February of 1871, a friendly letter, and they picked up their correspondence right away. So they weren't affected personally, at least in any way. Uh, one can also read Hermit's words of praise after he visited Göttingen in 1877 to attend the Gauss celebration. Probably no French mathematician could match Hermit's enthusiasm for German mathematics despite his difficulties with the language. By the 1880s, a handful of younger French mathematicians were going abroad to study at leading German universities. One of those was Paul Penlevé, who spent a year in Göttingen with Schwarz and, and Klein. Um, as far as, as Sophus Lee is concerned, that was an even more important mathematical correspondence between Dabu, who appreciated Lee's work very much. Um, and as I mentioned, he wrote an obituary for Sophus Lee. Um, you probably know this story about how Lee was detained after the war broke out, and he writes about that, Darbu, in this obituary for Lee. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the Norwegian had been detained at the outset of the war on suspicions that he might have been a German spy. Lee happened to be carrying letters from Klein, written in what seemed like a strange German code language, words like Linien und Kugelkomplex, etc., made the police who caught him wandering around in the woods rather suspicious. This strange-looking stuff made them think that perhaps this complex was the name of his contact in Germany. So they took no chances and arrested him. Darbu, a month later, comes to get him out and so forth, and he wrote in the obituary that he was very pleased on meeting Lee to see that his friend was not all that angry with the French authorities. In fact, Lee later recalled this is a mildly pleasant experience since it gave him time to absorb himself in his new discoveries. <laughs> so, um, so for a mathematician like Lee, maybe spending a month in prison wasn't such a bad thing. Uh, only shortly before this time, he found his famous line to sphere mapping, a contact transformation with many interesting properties. A pretty example comes from the image of a quadric surface. Uh, when you look at it in line geometry, as a family of lines, so a system of generators for a quadric surface, which will be mapped to a De Palm cyclid. One can picture this most easily by taking three skew lines in space, and these then would map over to three spheres, 
then you look at the envelope of lines that meet those three, and it's a contact transformation. So these then go over to the system of spheres, one, one parameter family of spheres that touch the three fixed spheres, and that's a Dupont cyclid. So this was the kind of basic connection that Lee saw. Uh, and he moreover recognized that this mapping has the property that the asymptotic curves of the first surface go over into the curvature lines of the second. So in this case, the simple case, the generators themselves are the asymptotic lines, and these then correspond to the circles of tangency of the Dupont cyclic. But there's an important connection, and Barnaby gave us a taste of this in his talk this morning about generalized cyclids and so forth. So there's the connection right away that Darbu saw when he talked to Lee about this stuff, generalized cyclids. Um, in 1864, Darbu and Theodore Mutar began work on generalized cyclids, which they studied in the context of inversive geometry. So what Barnabé was talking about, the fixed sphere and the orthogonal surfaces, you get to that and transformations thereof. Um, Klein and Lee learned about this new French theory when they met Darbu just before the Franco-Prussian War. Darbu later developed the theory of generalized cyclids by introducing pentaspherical coordinates. That's 1873, right, when that comes out. These objects are special quartic surfaces with the property that they meet the plane at infinity in a double curved, the imaginary circle that lies on all spheres, as Barnaby explained this morning. Uh, Dabu also found that, um, he also found that the lines of curvature on these generalized cyclids are algebraic curves of eighth degree, and because these goes, go back over into the asymptotic curves of the other surface, he, he figured out, Lee did, a quite amazing discovery, and I guess that concerns the Kummer surface, because what he saw was that these generalized cyclids map over to Kummer surfaces. So um, this all comes from line geometry again and so forth. Um, Lee found that, well, that's the connection he, he made. Um, and these things had been studied for the first time really by, by Kummer in the 1860s. So the eighth degree algebraic curve, which is the lines of curvature on a generalized cyclid, maps over to a 16th degree algebraic curve, which happens to give you the asymptotic curves, the family of curves on these surfaces. Um, well, a rather famous discovery that was made at that time. And the war breaks out, so it's not so clear what the details of this are, and Klein and Lee are talking about it and so forth. And so only days afterward, Klein has to flee from Paris, and he's writing these letters I told you about, you know, that, that the police found when they, when they, captured, uh, they captured Lee in Fontainebleau. Um, so here's a picture of one of these letters. This is from July 1871. It's only a couple of weeks after the war broke out. And, uh, and in this letter, uh, the model I showed you here, by the way, is not the, not the simple model you probably know here and in other places. This one is made in zinc, and it goes back to 1871. These are real old models that, that Klein made. Uh, he had an even earlier one that has disappeared, I think. But he was playing around with these models. Whoops. He, was, he had this model, and he, and he knew what the curves were, and he knew how they some of their properties between any two nodes. And so what he sketched for Lee in this letter is using the model kind of figured out how the inflection points and all of that stuff must, must look. And that's what shows up in the printed version of their work when they did this. So it's an interesting example of using models to find visual things in mathematics. Well, these were obviously exciting times, both mathematically and politically. And for many years afterward, Klein and Lee hoped to meet again in Paris. 
In 1882, that chance finally looked possible, but then Klein was in the midst of this famous competition with Poincaré, collapses pretty much, and Lee ends up coming to Paris on his own. That's at least fortunate for us in a way, because then he wrote three letters to Klein reporting on what was going on in Paris. And it's interesting, too, that the first time they were in Paris, a very, very exciting time for both of them, uh, they wrote a report on what was going on in Paris at the time, and a great deal of that report had to do with Gaston Darbou and how impressed they were with all of his plans for French mathematics. So that's back in 1870. Here I wanted to just give you a taste of, um, of what Lee has to say about what's going on in Paris. These are just excerpts from some of these letters. But I've always found letters exceedingly interesting and important for historians of mathematics. Obviously, people will write things in a private letter that they would never put in print, let alone an obituary or something. And these are, this is gossip from Paris. Take it for what you will, but it is, uh, it's entertaining, at least. I've spoken now with Hermite about all kinds of things. This is Lee writing to Klein. He has a very amiable nature, but I still don't know how much of it is genuine. People here say it certainly can't read a word of German, which in, would explain a number of things. The most remarkable thing he said was the following, which I communicate to you in confidence. <laughs> Mittag Leffler told him that the German mathematicians hate the French mathematicians, nor did he want to hear anything of my protests against this. Well, that's certainly strong. He was eager to hear about friction between German mathematicians, whereas he described the situation in Paris as idyllic in this regard. Probably it's no better in Paris than in Germany. Uh, then in another letter, uh, well, he, he writes again, I should say, he write, writes right after that, regretting that he told Klein that, and no, Mittaglepser is really a good guy, and you shouldn't take that so seriously, and so forth. But here, here it's a, a bit about um, what he heard from Poincaré. And this is kind of interesting because, uh, of course, the group idea and Erlangen program and all of that, and that's part of the traditional historiography too, that, of course, Klein and Lee coming to Paris and meeting Jordan and all of that. It's 1882, and Poincaré has never heard of the Erlangen program. <laughs> so that's, that's the one thing he hears here. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I told him about your Erlangen program, which he did not know. Alvin, uh, Dabu, and Stefano spoke with the highest praise about you. Until, until now, I haven't spoken very little. I've spoken very little with Jordan, whose mother died recently. And then, in the meantime, I've spoken at length with Jordan. He finds your investigations difficult to understand. Poincaré said that at first it was hard for him to read your work, but that it now goes very easily. That's Poincaré, though. A number of mathematicians, such as Dabu and Jordan, say that you make great demands on the reader in that you often do not supply proofs. I'm trying to report as accurately as possible. So then uh, he talks about how his own work is perceived, and this is particularly relevant when talking about Dabu. So far as my own things go, I'm more or less satisfied. Dabu has studied my work with remarkable thoroughness. Well, this is good insofar as he's given gradually more lectures on my theories at the Sabon, for example, on line and sphere geometry, contact transformations, and first order partial differential equations. The trouble is he continually plunders my work. He makes inessential changes and then publishes these without mentioning my name. Now he's starting on the surfaces of constant curvature. I must therefore rework my papers from Christiania for the Mathematische Annalen just as soon as possible. Maybe I could insert Sophus Lee was difficult. <laughs> and uh, so Dabu is not the only one who gets a lot of bad press from Sophus Lee and his letters to Klein and so forth. But that's another matter. Uh, then he has a little a little bit about uh, conversation with Victor Mannheim, the inventor of the modern slide rule. Mannheim is friendly as always. He's really a good fellow, 
And he warns me constantly about Dabu, for which he really has good reason. <laughs> but I must speak with Dabu, as he is the one who understands me the best, and for the pleasure I must pay something. In any case, he is promoting mathematical science. Well, anyway, you can see private letters, people say things. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I think it's, it's clear that uh, Klein felt somewhat similarly. There's a lot of carping and complaining about Dabu and so forth, but the two of them, of course, share a very similar spirit about cooperation and various other things, and they cooperate a great deal. Uh, so just a bit about that. Um, Klein and Dabu had several dealings over the years since both of them were heavily involved with various national and international projects. A year after the Paris ICM, for example, Darbou succeeded uh, Joseph Bertrand as perpetual secretary of the mathematical section of the academy. By then, he, Darbou, and Klein had emerged as the two most active and visible mathematicians in their respective countries. Their contacts, however, ended with the outbreak of the Great War. Of course. So let us just recall that right at the outset of the war, 93 German intellectuals attached their names to a manifesto that proudly announced full support of all actions taken by the German army, beginning with its invasion of Belgium. Quite a number, quite a number of the signatories were prominent natural scientists, including Max Planck, Fritz Haber, Walter Nernst, Ernst Fischer, and Ernst Haeckel, whereas only one mathematician appeared on the list, and that was Felix Klein. We know rather little about how these names were collected, so it's unclear whether Hilbert actually withheld his support. I'm unaware of any evidence that he was even contacted at all. On the other hand, if he had been asked to lend his name, he almost surely would have refused. Klein was reached by telephone and gave his support without ever even reading the document. When it was released, the French Academy dropped his name from its membership roles. There was debate in the Academy, in fact, about whether all Germans should be dismissed, but that, that action wasn't taken, and so Hilbert remained a foreign member. To the best of my knowledge, no actions were taken by any of the German academies against French members. At this time, Klein had begun his celebrated wartime lectures on the history of mathematics in the 19th century. These later circulated in mimeograph form and were eventually published in 1926, one year after Klein's death. They offer a highly personal view in which national rivalries play a major role. Klein underscored the significance of the Eco Polytechnique as a model for several polytechnical institutes that followed in its wake. He alluded to Jacobi's remarkable lecture in praise of the Eco Polytechnique, a speech delivered at a time when Parisian mathematics stood at its peak. Klein had cultivated friendly but formal relations with Dabou, Poincaré, and other leading French mathematicians. Yet his high respect for French achievements in no way diminished his sense of nationalist pride. Like nearly all Germans of his generation, Klein celebrated the Battle of Sedan as the key event that led to the unification of Germany. No doubt he attached significance to the fact that the crowning of King Wilhelm of Prussia as emperor took place in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles rather than in his own palace in Berlin. Before the war, Darbu and Klein, do I have them here? Ah, this is Hilbert, okay. Before the war, Dabu and Klein had, had worked together to help found uh, the International Association of Academies. Such cooperation was obviously unthinkable in wartime, and in November 1916, Dabu wrote to the physicist Arthur Schuster, secretary of the Royal Society, suggesting a meeting of leading scientists from the Entente powers to address what should be done with regard to international relations after the war. Since he died in February 1917, nothing came of this initiative, but his successor, Emile Picard, took up this matter before the fighting had come to an end. Picard's attitude toward French scientists was similar to Clemenceau's attitude toward German <laughs> politicians. By the mid-1920s, however, 
Rian and Schreisemann were able to overcome this hardline position in politics anyway, whereas uh, Hilbert emerged as the leading German representative of a rapprochement in the world of mathematics. In 1928, Hilbert led the effort to support the Bologna ICM, defeating the obstructionist stand led by Bieberbach and Brauer. And that's only one example showing his internationalist outlook, which brings me back to the obituary for Darbu, the speech he gives in Göttingen in 1917. Three months after Darbu's death, in May 1917, Hilbert delivered his eulogy at a special meeting of the Göttingen Scientific Society. Darbu belonged to that body as a foreign member since 1901 when he succeeded Ermit. This speech was not an altogether unusual tribute to, sorry, it was a totally altogether unusual tribute to a foreign scholar, and it caused him an immediate stir, caused an immediate stir in Göttingen academic circles. Because neither Klein nor Hilbert had ever given, written an obituary for a foreign member of the society, Hermit or anyone else, so that there was no precedent for it whatsoever. One can hardly escape the conclusion that Hilbert's motivation was in large part political, though personal gratitude could also have played a role as well. In 1905, Dabu and Klein had been charged with the difficult task of judging who should be awarded the first Bolyai Prize. What made this decision delicate, of course, was the personal and national prestige involved, the problem of choosing between Poincaré and Hilbert, the only names that received serious consideration. Klein naturally favored Hilbert, just as Darbu supported Poincaré, who was awarded the prize. But Darbu agreed that he would support Hilbert's nomination for the second prize in 1910, and on that occasion, Poincaré himself wrote the report that backed up that decision. Well, those were probably incidental things. I think it was really politics uh, that was the decisive thing. Hilbert clearly saw this as a golden opportunity to express his outspoken internationalist views before the Göttingen Scientific Society, which met only once a year in public session. So he, he took this as the opportunity to deliver his eloge in honor of Darbu, and um, in order to acknowledge the passing of a great mathematician. It also um, was meant, of course, as a direct provocation at those among his colleagues who saw their French counterparts as mortal enemies. According to Hilbert's biographer, Constance Reed, when word got out in the town, a mob of students gathered in front of Hilbert's house to demand that he withdraw the text. Uh, Reed's rather romantic account was largely based on oral interviews, so I can't substantiate all of that, but uh, there's certainly something to it. And the part that is quite interesting is she claims that he demanded from the rector a public apology for the behavior of the students or he would resign his position. In 1919, he took on serious negotiations to leave Göttingen and go to Bern. So, I mean, it's not unthinkable. Uh, <clears throat> in his speech, Hilbert began by praising Darbu and Camille Jordan for their universality. He claimed that this had opened the way for a younger generation of mathematicians who no longer felt hemmed in by the special disciplines that dominated earlier research. This universal outlook had long been a watchword for gutting in mathematics in the era of Klein and, and Hilbert. So by identifying Darbu with it, he underscored the intellectual affinities that linked Darbu with the Göttingen tradition. Hilbert also recalled how Darbu in his plenary address, well, we heard a lot about it from, uh, from Philippe, the 1908 uh, address and, and problems. I really regret that he's not here because I have a question for him about what exactly, well, I'll read on here, but I mean, uh, I, I was trying to connect what I read about in Hilbert's speech to what, what uh, Philippe told us today about that 1908 speech on problems in uh, geometry and analysis, differential geometry, given by Darbu. Uh, what Hilbert says about it is that um, uh, he recalls being there and hearing the speech, and, and he says that... Um, 
In it, Dabu compared his own era with the new trends then unfolding at the outset of the 20th century. For Hilbert, it was personally gratifying to remember how this grand older representative of French mathematics, who was by now only an outside observer, had spoken up in support of these radically new developments. In short, he saw Dabou as a progressive spirit, or portrayed him as such in this, in this speech. Um, Following these introductory remarks, Hilbert alluded to the various phases in Dabu's career, starting with the impression he made already as a student on his countrymen. Here he mentions the well-known anecdote, and Barnabé filled it in in great detail what was going on, the well-known anecdote about how after scoring first among all candidates for both écoles, Dabu chose to attend the École Normale. In Hilbert's telling, though, we can easily hear voices of an anti-militarist theme. He noted that Dabu grew up in modest circumstances and he lost his father at a young age. About his decision not to attend the Eco Polytechnique, uh, Hilbert wrote that Dabu chose, quote, to decline the sword and gold embroidered cloak of an officer or civil engineer in preference for the more humble title of a professor and the less distinguished teaching professor, profession. I mean, after hearing you explain it, actually, I guess that's exactly right, but, <laughs> um, but, he, but here's something interesting, I think. Um, so he goes on and says that, that a young man of such promise could make such a choice uh, was not just unusual, Hilbert said. It was something that had never before occurred and that awakened general astonishment at the time. And in support of this claim, he cited an article, and I was able to find it, in fact, by the, quote, then famous French Goethe expert, Jean-Jacques Weiss. Now, probably no one in the audience knew this name. Uh, I don't imagine anyone knew this name, but one can almost imagine their faces when they heard the most famous living German mathematician refer in wartime to some obscure Frenchman as a famous expert on Goethe. Weiss wanted to record this event, so Hilbert claimed to show, quote, how at least once something like this had occurred on our planet. Not surprisingly, Hilbert mentions Dabu's influence on Lee and Klein, but he also briefly describes three discussions written in, uh, three dissertations, sorry, written in Göttingen that were inspired by lesser known works by Dabu. So he really had facts to relate about Dabu's impact. When toward the end, he turns to Dabu's four volume uh, Theorie de Sefas, um, his praise is almost boundless. He calls this not only a standard work for surface theory, but also an invaluable tool for studying mechanics, calculus of variations, partial differential equations, and even invariant theory. Moreover, in Hilbert's view, no one before Dabu had recognized the deep connections between these fields of central importance for contemporary research. Darbu's treatise, he wrote, belongs in the library of every mathematician, just like such other works as Jordan's Cours d'Analyse, Picard's Traité d'Analyse, and Poincaré's Mécanique Celeste. So his message, um, his message could, hardly have, uh, could hardly have been clearer. These great works belong to all mathematicians because the world of mathematics knows no national boundaries. Hilbert even alluded to the relevance of Darbu's work for Einstein's new theory of gravitation, and that was a really new theory in 1917. Einstein first met Hilbert when he came to Göttingen two years before then to give a series of Volscale lectures. And he then came to realize, Einstein did, that Hilbert was an outspoken internationalist who was unafraid to clash with opponents. In the final year of the war, Einstein contacted him to propose that they join hands with like-minded colleagues from other countries in order to make the case for peace and moral progress. He began his appeal, these are Einstein's words here, as such. Countless times in these desolate years of general nationalist delusion, 
Men of science and the arts issued statements to the public that have already inflicted incalculable damage to the feeling of solidarity that had been developing with such promise before the war. The hue and cry of straight-laced preachers, sight. for them the very word international is like a red flag for a bull. Hilbert also cautioned Einstein against, quote, firing off our gunpowder at the wrong time and possibly at the wrong persons. I would like to recommend waiting until the mad hurricane has spent itself and reason has the opportunity of returning, and this time is sure to come. We, could have, uh, we, could, we would have to restrict ourselves to the German professors since they alone are thoroughly known to us here and also have the most to do with it. Other peoples must wash their own dirty laundry. Well, nothing came of that venture at all, and of course, uh, this is before the Germans ever woke up to the idea they might lose the war, um, so things played out differently. Um, but around the same time, Hilbert also informed Klein that he refused to attend meetings of the Göttingen uh, Society so long as no one besides him was willing to protest the behavior of its secretary, Edward Schröder. Uh, Hilbert protested that Schröder, a Germanist who served as a captain in the German army during the war, had taken it upon himself to inform military authorities about the pacifist views of a colleague in physics. And these are just a few of the events that place Hilbert's obituary for Dabu, I think, in a, in a political context that makes it fairly clear why he would want to give such a speech. So let me just end now by going back a little bit in time to the year 1909. And this is Hilbert greeting Juan Carré, who gave the first series of Volskaya lectures in Göttingen. Um, and he had these remarks to make. You know, highly honored colleague, as do we all, how steady and close the mathematical interests of France and Germany have been and continue to be. Even when we recall only quickly the developments of the recent past and out of the rich, many-voiced concert of mathematical science, we take hold of the two fundamental tones of number theory and function theory, then we think perhaps of Jacobi, who had in Hermit the outstanding heir to his arithmetical ideas. And Hermit, who unfolded the flag of arithmetic in France, had our Minkowski, who brought it, back, brought it back to Germany. Minkowski had just died only months before this. Or if we only think of the names Cauchy, Riemann, Weierstrass, Poincaré, Klein, and Adama, these names build a chain whose links join one another in succession the mathematical threads tying France and Germany are like no two other nations, diverse and strong, so that from a mathematical perspective, we may view Germany and France as a single land. So that's the idealistic Hilbert, of course, uh, speaking. So thank you very much. Thank you.